Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Tim Gaither Podcast, Wrestling Wednesday. My guest today is Rick Williams. Rick Williams is a two-time NAIA champion. He's a wrestler for Iowa State. He's a Big 8 runner-up. He's a world bronze medalist. Uh, he's got a really interesting story about his comeback, and I can't wait to hear it. And uh, let's bring him in. Thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Oh, man. What an honor. I'm sorry that uh, it was messed up there for a while. Zoom is not a perfect... Uh, Perfect deal. Well, especially, um, seems like every time I use it, I, I struggle getting on. I don't know what it is, but hey, I'm here, so I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, I, I just had Dennis Hall on, and, and he had this great uh, uh, great story, and his face was freezing the whole time. You could hear him, but his face was uh-huh. frozen, and I was just like, no! <laughs> oh, I bet he's got some good ones. Yeah. Um, have you ever seen his match with uh, his 2004 Olympic Trials Finals with uh, Brandon Paulson? I was there. Oh, you were. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you saw like, you saw it live. Yeah. yeah. I, what, I, one of the reasons I I always say we should go back to um, first man scores. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, it, you know, I was sitting there watching it before I had him on. And I, I got tears in my eyes when it was. I was like, I was like, man, I've never seen two guys battle that hard for anything in my whole life. To this day, maybe the single best match I've ever seen. I mean, I was just. Uh, I was actually there with my roommate and teammate from Iowa State, and um, we flew in uh, up there to to the trials. And I mean, I, I just remember just the goosebumps watching that match, and just again, like you said, just watching two men battle the way they did it was it was incredible yeah he was a really cool guy to talk to also uh you know part of the the best thing about this for me is i used to just read about these guys in usa wrestling and then to talk to him like i've i tell people this all the time on the podcast i've i've met a lot of famous people and it it doesn't mean that much to me but when i talk to wrestlers i get kind of nervous and it's 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 kind of stupid but <laughs> no, that that's that's cool man i mean you get to it kind of tells you, you know, where your where your roots are from. Yeah, I like the battle gear hat. I was just talking to Gons Medina, and he gave me crap about my Rudis hat. He's like, I gotta send you some, I gotta send you some, uh, uh, some stuff from my company because I, I can't stand seeing your Rudis hat. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking the same thing when I saw that. I was like, okay, that's cool. I have to get you a battle gear hat out there. Yeah, I didn't realize. I almost, I almost emailed you last week and said, give me your address. I was going to try to send you a Battle Gear uh, hoodie or a hat. Oh, dude, I totally would have worn it. And I didn't realize until I sent the email, I was like, oh, that's uh, the same company as Matt, in, Matt and Franco right, works for, right? Yeah, that's we're partners. Okay, okay. Yep. Well, that all makes sense now. Yeah. Um, yep. So where did it start for the Williams brothers? How old were you when you started and all that? Uh, first grade, seven years old. Um, my brother... Honestly, probably can't ever remember not being on the map because he was he's four years b- behind me. So, like, when I was a senior in high school, he was an eighth grader. So he just kind of grew up being on the mats and around him. Um, for me, at the time, my mom was a single mother, and um, I remember she came home one day and said, hey, you're going you're gonna to go to a wrestling practice tonight. Well, in my mind, all I thought was, you know, like um, pro wrestling. Yeah. And so I was like, no, I'm not doing that. She's like, yeah, you are. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to play hockey. And she's like, no, you're going to go. Because we, we skated all the time, I remember. And uh, she's like, no, you're going to go to wrestling. And uh, we went to our – my uncle took me to my first practice. And I tell people, I was like, it's just one of those things where they were just like, okay, this is kind of what they're going to do. They're going to try to take you down or you're going to try to get them down and hold them. And it just clicked. I was like, yeah, that just makes sense, you know. And so I, I fell in love with it. Were you good from the start? I was, I mean, um, I think I was second my first year at seven or whatever it was in the first grade. Um, fourth or fifth as a, at my second year, I, I lost a, a couple matches for clasping hands. Just, I just really didn't think. And then I, I think I won every, every state title after that until – um, my sophomore year, I lost, got third that year, and then won it again my junior and senior year. Okay, so you were a two or three times state champion in high school. Three. I, I won it my freshman, junior, and senior. Okay. How many losses did you have in high school? Do you know? Five. Five. Yeah, I lost five. I had uh, uh, let's see, one for a legal slam, one uh, for a uh, two for a head injury, 
And then I lost in the state semis my sophomore year. And I lost to another um, uh, state runner up as a freshman the first of the year. Uh, I beat him in the pool and he beat me in the uh, championships. He was a junior, senior. Um, and so that was my two losses and then uh, two injury defaults and a, and, a, and a disqualification for an illegal slam. And Brett had a really similar career too, right? Three titles and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty freaky. I mean, so as a freshman, I made the uh, 87 world team with uh, Aiken and Joe Block and a um, bunch of great guys. Guys, man, we won the world championship in '87 up in Canada, and um, and then come back as a sophomore, um, lost seven six in the semis um, to another defending state champion, and um, and then come back and win it my junior senior year. And Brett uh, wins it as a freshman, makes the world team, gets third at the world championships, comes back, loses it as a sophomore, and wins it as a junior and senior. Wow, pretty, pretty wild. Yeah. Um, still to this day, um, I mean, I'm 45, I haven't wrestled in a long time, but one of the best, best, uh, victories I ever had was I beat Brett in the, in the Blue Valley Invitational when we were eight years old and it was two to two criteria and my dad still claims it's, is like the best match, one of the best matches I ever saw you wrestle. He's like, you guys just were all over the place and scrambling all over the place and, and I already knew who he was, you know, and I was super nervous and, uh, um, so he was always a stud and so then I always followed his career and then I didn't even realize, you know, that you were his older brother. And so it's just really cool that, uh, that you guys are so dominant. And, and, uh, and now you're, you're, in, uh, you're in business with, with one of the few guys that beat him in high school. I guess they both traded uh, victories, him and Franca. And I oh, was... yeah. And the crazy thing was they were like best friends. Oh, really? Oh yeah, Matt and I mean Brett and Matt were like always at the lake together. Always, just I mean, just I mean, like I said, I Matt's been like a brother uh, since I don't know. I probably coached my first team when I was eighteen. I, I helped coach the cadet and the schoolboy team. Took them to Michigan and stuff. And uh, Matt was on that team, and Brett was on that team, and a bunch of those guys. And um, I always loved. I mean, I was just a and I was just a junkie. I was always in the room and always, I mean, basically lived in Warrensburg for four years, training either myself or helping coach a team. And so I always say my first, I coached my first team at 18, um, you know, uh, ran the practices and did, a, and you know, the coaches gave me a lot of a leadway. And um, so, but yeah, Matt and Brett were like best buddies, man. It was, it was, um, I mean, they were pretty inseparable. I always remember when they were younger. Yeah, that's. It was the, funny because Sean Fry and I were the same way. Okay, I wrestled one of the Fries. I can't remember which one it was because there was like three or four of them, right? Mm, yeah, there was. Well, there was three: um, Sean, Ryan, and Brett. Um, I would have guessed it would have been Brett because Ryan would have been bigger. Yeah. Um, Brett was smaller, and yeah. Ryan didn't really wrestle. Um, I don't think he wrestled at all in high school. He played basketball and um, and baseball, and then obviously went to Mizzou and played at, at Mizzou baseball. Cool. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember those. I remember all those guys. And um, how many states? So you won three. Brett won three, and Franco won four. So many mm-hmm. studs came out of there, and you guys were all on the same. Uh, did, was it a junior world team or cadet world team? Uh, for who? When you and Aiken were on the when you Me got, and Aiken were on the eighty seven world team. That's when you got your bronze, right? That's when I got my bronze. Yeah. Awesome. I think eight got silver at that one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, had I lost to the Turk in the finals in overtime. Um, he ended up, I think he tech followed the guy in the finals. Um, and then I beat Japan for third, I think. Are you, uh, are you older or younger than Eric? I'm younger. Uh, Aiken was an 89. I was a 90. Okay. Is he uh, yeah. part of the reason you ended up at Iowa State? Yeah, he had a lot to do with it. I mean, so Aiken and I, I mean, I don't know a lot of people probably even knew, but Aiken and I were, I mean, I used to go to um, travel with him and his parents. You know, my parents didn't have a, you know, a lot of money or anything. And so um, John and Gene would always let me travel with them. Well, I would go to Bishop Miege and train over there um, with Aiken and Sonny and Gons and all those guys. And 
hell, my, I honestly, my sophomore year, they tried to talk me into moving to, to Bishop Miege, and we ended up staying at Oak Park but because I was just over there training all the time. But my thought was these guys are all um, one to two years older than me. And then I'm going to end up being here by myself and nobody. So um, <laughs> I ended up staying at Oak park and, um, but I trained with ache all the time. I mean, even in 99, when I kind of did my comeback and tried to, you know, make a go of it. Um, I spent a lot of time living with Eric and uh, Steph staying at their place and, I mean, to this day, some of the best battles I think I've ever been in is me and eight going up to either Blue Valley or Blue Valley Northwest or one of those schools. And just me and him walking in the room, you know, we'd shut the door and warm up. And, man, we would just proceed to get after it for, you know, an hour or two hours. And it was, oh, man, it was freaking awesome. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to see some of those uh, matches. And I was going to ask you. A little, oh, yeah. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about Aiken in a minute, but I wanted to hear about your uh, your your career at Iowa State. How did, how did that uh, play out for you? Well, man, it wasn't good. I mean, um, I, you know, I, um, I, I mean, where I stand now, I'm not one of those guys that look back and go, "Man, I wish I would have done," because I wouldn't give up my wife and my kids and my re- relationship with the Lord for. For, any, for a gold medal or a national championship or anything. Um, but when I got to Iowa State, man, I was pretty straight-laced. Like, I mean, I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't, uh, I didn't take aspirin. I mean, I was just, I was just pretty straight-laced. And um, I got there, and, and my freshman year, I was behind uh, – uh, you know, back then, everybody redshirted, basically, as a freshman. Yeah. And so I was behind um, – uh, Dan Knight, Danny Knight, who was, you know, a, an Iowa legend. And, um, you know, I mean, beginning of the year, you know, Danny beat me pretty good by the end of the year. I mean, I, I think we were, it was a much better match. And, um, but you know, he was a returning all American. He was, a going to be a senior. And, um, and then he got, I don't know, you probably don't remember, but he got hurt the week of the, uh, of the big eights. Okay. And um, me and him were going at it, and he just landed wrong, and it messed his neck up, which he always had problems with anyway. And um, he didn't get to go. But so I felt like that freshman year, I was traveling with the team. I was, I mean, I, I by the end of the year, I felt like I was, you know, I'd go with anybody. I was going with him and Aiken and um, Marino and all those guys. And um, and then my sophomore year, man, my life just really started to unravel. Um, you know, my parents went through a divorce. Um, you know, I had some personal issues with, uh, with a female that, you know, I made some bad choices and, um, and, um, next thing I know, I'm, I'm drinking and smoking a lot of dope and just doing, making some really piss poor choices. And, and, um, I got, um, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of went to coach one time and just said, you know, I, I think I need to go home. I, I gotta, I just gotta kind of get my stuff straight. My, my brother was basically on his own and 16 years old and, And, um, you know, my parents were just, you know, what happens when you go through a divorce and you got a 16 year old at home, he, he kind of fends for himself and Brett started making some not good decisions either. And, and, um, I thought I needed to go home and kind of help take care of him. And, um, long story short, you know, he was like, well, you can, but you know, I can't promise you'll have anything here when you come back. And, you know, I mean, at, at 19, uh, 20 years old, I mean, that kind of just hit me like, well, I mean, because I always made my own decisions, even at 18. I, I mean, I went to Iowa State on a recruiting trip, and, you know, I, I decided all that by myself. And, and um, I thought, well, I guess I better stay. And, and so I stayed, but for the next two years, man, I just went through the motions, um, which was sad because, I mean, I probably had no business being in the starting lineup. But you know how that is? You're like, like I'm not really training. I'm not really in this. I'm kind of going through the motions. But yet when a wrestle-off comes – you game up and I, I probably shouldn't have been. I mean, I wasn't in a good state of mind. I was, I was all over the place. And, and then I started dealing dope and, and I just started getting in some bad ways. And, and then coach Douglas came in, um, uh, after my red shirt freshman year, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of people probably don't know this. I didn't make weight at nationals. I, uh, I ended oh, wow. up third at the big eights and qualified for the nationals. Uh, again, one of those things where I had probably no business, um, but I got to the big eights and I wrestled a Mizzou guy for third, you know, a top three were automatic qualifiers. And man, it was just one of those moments where I was like, 
yeah, I'm not going to lose to a Missouri guy. <laughs> and I end up beating him. He beat me one nothing earlier at the at the uh, Northern Open in Wisconsin. And uh, I ended up beating him for third, so I got the automatic bid. And a um, few days later, <clears throat> we're working out. We weren't really supposed to be going with anybody, any other starters, but me and Marino were going together. And we kind of both hit an inside trip, and he set before I did. And I heard my knee just, you know, cr- you know, just – crinkle and I was like oh man and uh, sprained all my ligaments so man I got to Oklahoma City and I was about 12 13 pounds over oh wow and I started cutting real hard and um got down the last way in and I was 126.01 oh wow and they're like you're done that's it and so man I was I was broke I went back to the hotel and I had I took two IV bags to get me back to normal and um Coach Gibbons came in and kind of read me the rights, which I deserved, man. I mean, I, I didn't, I wasn't doing things right. I deserved it. And, and, um, he woke me up, uh, like four or five the next morning and he said, grab your bags. And he took me to the airport and handed me a ticket. And he said, you remember when you're, uh, when your plane's flying out over Oklahoma city, uh, your teammates would be taking the, the mat at the national championships. And, I was like, okay. And I got out, I went home and I was on about a four month binge. I was just, I was a mess, man. And, and, um, and so, you know, that, that it, it only got worse. I mean, I stopped drinking, but I started dealing a lot of dope and I started smoking a lot of dope and coach Douglas came in and, um, you know, at first it seemed like it was a fresh start. He took me to the, um, uh, you know, uh, as Aiken said, you know, Coach Douglas was uh, on the Olympic team staff, and so, you know, he calls me and he said, uh, I got a plane ticket. You're going to be in um, – I'm going to fly you into Philadelphia for the – I think it was the 93 World Team Training Camp. So, I mean, you know, of course, Kevin Jackson's one of our coaches and Steve Knight and Joe Gibbons and, and all these phenomenal coaches at Iowa State, and they're all on Foxcatcher guys anyway. And so, I mean, just the stories that you would hear and, uh, and then you get to be at the DuPont farm training with all these guys. And, you know, I mean, everybody that was anybody was there. Um, and, um, you know, so I started thinking like things were kind of getting better and, and, um, but it had ended up, I just, and again, I take 90% of the responsibility. Me and Douglas, man, we just, we didn't see eye to eye, man. He, um, you know, he, he kind of had his favorites and I wasn't one of them. And, yeah. and, um, you know, I don't think Matt Johnson was one of them and some of, you know, some of the guys that, you know, just, he had a different philosophy and I don't think we fit it. And, and I didn't fit it. The sad part was, is the old me would have fit his ideal perfectly, but the new me just, just didn't work. And so, um, <clears throat> 90, 93, I kind of got everything back together and, um, I kind of beefed up cause I was going to go 34 so I came in season about 155 and, um, and, um, Sean Harrison was, uh, defending, or he was third in, in 92, uh, that year I didn't make weight. And so that next year, you know, I, I, uh, I ended up beating him in the last minute at the, um, at the duel. And, um, I lost to, um, I lost to Sean Charles on riding time. I was feeling pretty good. Yeah. Um, but you know, in one of those situations, you're pretty, you're feeling good, but you also know you're pretty fragile and one little thing goes wrong and, and things just fall apart for you. So 93, um, coach Douglas, uh, if you remember Oklahoma state got the death penalty in 93. Yeah. So at Christmas I was 34. Um, I was going to be eligible at, at semester. I'd been winning the, uh, wrestling in the opens. I won the Nebraska Omaha open, the brands open over there. I, I'm pretty sure I beat Zadig there that year. Um, uh, lost an overtime match to Joe Block. Um, you know, things were going pretty good. And, and uh, you remember Jody Wilson out of Oklahoma State? Yeah. I so that. Jody Wilson transfers to Iowa State. And Douglas pulled me and um, uh, Derek Monsier in, uh, in his office. And he said, hey, um, I need you guys to get prepared. You're going to drop to 26 and 34. And we're like, for what? And he's like, well, Jody Wilson's transferring in. And he's going to go 42. Now, Derek may say different, but if I remember right, we kind of looked at each other like, well, how come he doesn't have to wrestle off? And the loser come down to 34, and the loser have to decide from there what to do. And he said, and Douglas was just like, because I said so, you're going 26 and you're going 34. You know, wow. that's just how it's going to be. And 
So we, we pissed and moaned, but we started our weight cut and ended up getting down to 26. And I mean, I was feeling good. Like I said, we, um, I ended up losing to Sean in a dual meet four, three on riding time. And, um, I lost to Tony Perler transferred to, um, Nebraska that year. Okay. I think I lost to Tony in the, um, in the big eight finals. I, I made your decision, Sean Harrison in the semis. I lost to Tony in the finals, like four, two or three, one or something like that. And, um, I think I went in seated eighth or ninth and I was on the same side as, um, Sean. Okay. And I felt pretty good. You know, I felt like, man, I think I'm on the right side. I think I got a, a, a good, a good line here. And, um, I know it sounds crazy, man. I, I woke up that morning and um, I, something didn't feel right. Like I body wise, like first time in a long time, I just didn't feel right. And uh, I got in a match. Um, I'm trying to think of the kid's name is uh, Oklahoma kid, um, about six foot tall, 126 pounder from uh, Duke. Okay. And uh, man, we got after it, and uh, it was uh, we went into overtime. I was pretty good top and bottom at that time. Coach Douglas really impacted me on riding top and bottom. And, um, man, I kind of went for it right there at the end, and and I fell back, and he got a two-count right as time ran out, and I ended up losing. And he loses the next match to a guy that I had never lost to who ends up being an All-American. And, again, I I left the the arena – pretty fragile and and um i was i was pretty much out of it for quite a while and um came back in 94 um kind of felt like i was like tired of being tired you know that feeling and and um i started i I felt good i was training good i I felt good i knew i was going to be eligible at semester so i knew i was only going to have to make 26 for one semester and I, i was feeling pretty good and um we had a certain guy in our room that, you know, we used to light up pretty good. And, uh, but he was one of Douglas's boys. And, and, um, you know, I, I remember thinking back, man, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I'm going to be a starter. I I've been a starter. I'm, I'm going to be a starter. And, and this guy's red shirting and, you know, we're, we're beating him up pretty good. And, and I'd always look over and it seems like coach would always be over there sitting with him and got his arm around him, kind of talking to him and always just felt like we were out on an Island And so, um, I was ineligible, so I wasn't supposed to be able to wrestle off and, um, I got my workout in like I was supposed to. Um, but I always just seemed like, and again, it's probably just because of where I was. Um, I always seemed like he was just always on me. Like I'd be at, I'd be at morning workouts. I'd be done. I'd be in the training room and he'd be yelling my name and why aren't you working out? I'm like, cause I'm already done, you know? And, and, um, it just, I don't know. I just, it, it wasn't working. And, and, um, I got my workout in that day and, and I was talking to some of the boosters and, and, uh, you know, I just, they were asking me how I was doing. I was like, I'm doing good. I feel good. I'm, you know, I'll be eligible at semester and, and grades were all going good. It seemed like, and, um, man, coach and I, he, uh, I, I hear somebody yelling my name and I kind of look over my shoulder at the wrestle offs and here he comes walking across me. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm talking to just talking. And he's like, why aren't you ready for wrestle offs? I'm like, because I'm ineligible. He said, I can't wrestle off. So he says, well, you are. So I go change and he makes me wrestle Sean Charles in the wrestle off. Well, I mean, Sean's huge out of season. And now he's one of our grad assistants at Iowa state and he's probably 180 pounds. And (laughs) so I wrestle him and I lose and I, and I lose it, man. I go to the locker room and I'm kicking and screaming and I'm throwing stuff. And I'm just like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not doing this no more. And it was the first time I remember Kevin Jackson came in and he's like, Hey man, don't do it. Don't, don't let another man influence you like that. You know, you'll be fine. And I was just like, KJ, I can't do it, man. I just can't do it. And I grabbed my stuff and I left and uh, I came back like four days later and he is calling our, uh, calling our, our, our home. And, and uh, probably one of the dumbest mistakes I probably ever made because I thought I was doing something to hurt somebody else. And, all I ever did was, I mean, I hurt myself and my teammates and, and, uh, he kept saying, just come talk to me, come talk to me. And, um, so I went to his office and I walked in and I, man, I was on edge and I, I, in my mind, I knew, and he was like, you know, uh, take your time, you know, you'll make, you can make the weight whenever you're ready. And, you know, I think you can win the national title. And, and, I, and 
literally maybe one of the dumbest things ever come out of my mouth. I said, yeah, you know what? I think I can too, but I won't do it for you. And I walked out and uh, it was finals week. And so um, like an idiot, uh, I skipped all my finals because I knew if I took them, like in my mind, I thought someone might talk me back into coming back out. And um, so like an idiot, I skipped the finals and and I, I left school and was, I mean, I was, I was no good anyway, man. I wasn't, I was a, I was a bad person. I mean, I was, I wasn't somebody that, you know, that needed to be around anybody. And unfortunately, and, and, um, you know, like, that's why I always say, you know, when I started to write this book about my testimony, I always said, man, I don't, I never blame coach Gibbons or coach Douglas. I mean, I, I'll own all of that, man. It was, I, I made bad decisions. I started doing bad things and, and, um, um, I was reaping what I was selling, you know? Yeah. So, it, you know, it's it's crazy, though, like you kind of touched on earlier. Everything that you do in your life, though, good, bad, and indifferent, leads you to where you're at. And you wouldn't trade any of it. So it kind of, you know, it kind of had to happen. If you had gone and won that national title, I don't know when you met your wife, but it, it may not have worked out that way. You know, you may not have met her or, or however it worked out. Um, and, and I try to tell myself that all the time because we all have regrets or things we wish we would have done or, you know, especially... Oh, yeah concerning athletic careers and all that so um how did you well, end man, up, i totally agree yeah how did you end up at lindenwood <laughs> so i left and i went home and um i was still dealing dope and working and and uh just kind of just being no good and uh my brother was actually at the state championships and i went down to watch and uh, I was in the uh, Mizzou room watching workouts, and um, the guy coaching uh, at at uh, Lindenwood at the time is Stacy Wyland. I don't right. know if you remember Stacy, but Stacy used to help like when when our national team would be at Warrensburg training. Stacy would come. He wrestled at Oklahoma, and he he would come up because he was a Missouri guy. He'd come up and, and help coach and work out and stuff. So I I've known him since I was probably a junior in high school okay and um he came over to me and he's like man what are you doing and i was like nothing i said I'm just watching my brother and he's like will not you come back and wrestle for me and i kind of laughed i was like yeah man i don't think that's a good idea and he's like why i go well one i don't think i'm the kind of guy you want around your team i said and two um man you'll never get me eligible and he said okay i'll make a deal with you he said if i get you eligible you come back and wrestle well, I was like, sure. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So I, I leave and, and um, um, it's August now. I hadn't talked to Stacy since that day. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in my, I'm living with my grandmother and grandfather because I've always been really close to them. And I was living with them and the phone rings and it's Stacy. And he says, hey, what's up? And I was like, nothing. He's like, hey, um, you remember when I told you if I could get you eligible I asked you if you'd come back and wrestle. And I was like, yeah. He goes, I got it. I go, no way. He goes, yeah. He goes, I can get you eligible by semester. And I was like, how? And he goes, well, we have this adult program. And because you're older, he goes, I can get you in the adult program. So you could take 12 hours during the day, normal school. And then you could go to class Tuesdays and Thursdays and pick up another 12 hours in the adult program. And you'll have 24 hours at semester. He goes, what do you think? And Man, I just, I kind of knew that I needed to go. And so I was like, I'll do it. And he goes, okay, well, here's the bad news. And I was like, all right, here it comes. What? And he goes, school starts tomorrow. <laughs> and I go, oh, man. I go, okay, um, let me grab some things and I'm on my way. And he's like, all right. He goes, well, when you get close, come to this address. I said, okay. So I walked in. I told my grandmother, I said, I think I'm going back to school. I'm going to finish wrestling. And she says, okay. I I literally grabbed a couple bags and, and jumped in my truck and I started driving to St. Louis and, and, um, next thing I know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm taking 24 hours. I pass 21 hours, 24. Uh, I passed 21 hours that semester and I'm like, see, man. I, and I was spent. I mean, my mind, my, my brain was smoking and he goes, don't worry about it. He goes, um, uh, the team's about ready to go to Florida for a trip, but you're going to stay and take an, uh, a Christmas class. I'm like, wait, I got to take a class and you guys are going to Florida. And he goes, yeah. I go, what kind of class? And he goes, poetry. I go, oh man. I go, are you kidding me? I go, you set me up to fail. And he goes, no, no, you'll be fine. 
I ended up getting an A in the class and absolutely love the class. Cool. And I'm eligible second semester and, and, um, and I, I win the national title and for him and then come back the next year. And, and now my brother's there. Um, he left Iowa state cause it just, I, I probably left a bad taste in everybody's mouth. And so Brett goes up there for a year and ends up leaving and comes down and he's a freshman at Lindenwood my senior year. And we end up, you know, both winning a national title for him and, and um, and then right after we win a national title, you know, I get you know I get picked up by the DEA at the airport, and and um, and things went from holy from bad to like you know really bad, and um, and so I had to skip town, and um, Brett uh, ends up leave grab you know loading our stuff and leaving, and and uh, we had to get the hell out of there for lack of better terms. Yeah. So you won two national titles. Brett won one his freshman year, and then did he not wrestle anymore, or did he keep? No. Well, so he went to um, he went to um, believe it or not, I, I got a job later on at Kemper. I was coaching at Kemper Junior College. Okay. And um, I don't know if you remember. Um, Oh, I just went. I just went blank on coach's name, uh, but he was the William Crispin coach. Calls me up. And he says, um, "I just got a new head coaching job at Kemper Junior College. I need you to come coach with me." Okay. Well, I was on the, you know, I was in that process of being, you know, charged or not charged and all that stuff. And and uh, man, I was just like, man, this is a chance to breathe. And and so I took the job, and because he was a good man to be around, and and um, and I ended up. Uh, I had, I had my oldest daughter at that time and my brother was living with us. And, and so it was Jody and me and my daughter and Brett and Brett was helping take care of her. And, and then he, at the very end, he ended up wrestling at the junior college nationals and, um, ended up fifth, maybe lost to the national champion on a, on a last second call. And, and, um, then he just really didn't care after that. And so then the next year he goes to Mizzou, he walks on at Mizzou and, um, loses to Guerrero, like, six, five at the St. Louis open or something crazy. I mean, um, he's right there and, and training and, um, man, believe it or not, he, he gets saved not much after I do. And he just loses all focus for wrestling. He's like, I don't, this stuff doesn't even really mean anything. Huh. And, um, he just ended up, you know, not doing anything. And then, you know, the year 99, when I started training again, he actually helped train with me and went to the U S open, won a couple matches and, um, and stuff. But I mean, basically, you know, he had, he was like, I'm just doing it because it helps you, man. And which was great because man, our goes were like me and Aiken goes, I mean, yeah. they were, whew. but, um, you know, him and Ironman basically and, and Bogdan and Ariel, I mean, that's, I just went hard with those guys every day. And, and, um, so yeah, that's, so that he ended up going back to Mizzou and then just, Never did anything. He ended up helping coach down at Neosho with uh, him and Ironman lived together down at Neosho. And uh, Brett was helping coach down there and and uh, basically working out just because he was helping with, you know, work out with me and Ironman and stuff. And, um, yeah, help, he, you know, my brother helped me help raise our kids when they were little and stuff. So, I mean, my, Brett and I have been so close. I mean, hell, we lived together until we were, you know, late 20s or whatever. So Okay. Cool. Crazy. Um you had said in your Facebook story that um, that even the, when you were winning your titles at Lindenwood, you said you were having all this success, but you were a terrible person. You said that in your own words. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Like, were you smoking pot the whole time you were winning those titles? And man, I was high when I won the Oklahoma Open. I was high when I won the <laughs> national championships. I was high. I was probably high the whole time. Wow. I mean, just and we were dealing dope by the pounds, and then we started moving into um, kilos. And I mean, I, I mean, I was a, I mean, hell Stacy had to hunt me down. I was, I hit out for like after the regionals, um, in 95, I don't think I went to practice for like 10 days. Wow. I was just like, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but I was like, what are you going to do? I'm yeah. not coming, you know? And, yeah. and, and then go. And, and so, yeah, I, I went and I win and, and, And knowing the kind of person I am now and the kind of person and the respect that I had for this sport all through high school and growing up, I mean, you know, I, and I had some people reach out to me after that face. I honestly did not post that like I was mentally not there or I, I just simply rem I just it's just one of those thoughts that hit me when when um, when Mike Tuck was introducing me. I, I just kind of cringe like, oh, can we leave the Lindenwood part out? Because, 
you know, I just was not a good, I, I wouldn't want anybody to think, oh, that's how you do it. Because that's not how you do it. I mean, that's why, no offense, that's why I was at Lindenwood winning it and not at, you know, Iowa State or something. And um, it just, you know, it just was one of those things. And so, yeah, I cringe when I when I talk about it and, you know, two national titles and, and I'm kind of embarrassed because I just know that I was a, I just wasn't a good person. I mean, there's times where I was training hard, but then there's times I'd, I'd be gone for a week and just, I'd be in Arizona picking up dope or I'd be off partying for five days and didn't really care. And still, and what, again, like I was telling you about Iowa state, somebody should have beat me out, but when it came time, I'd have a hard time not winning and Lennon would, you know, we'd get to the matches and I'd be like, well, I'm not going to lose, you know? And, and uh, I used to always joke myself, um, well, in the semis, I would just win because I didn't want to have to do all the wrestlebacks. So I could win in the semis. And then if I lost in the, in the finals, I didn't care. But then I would tell myself, well, I'm here. I might as well win too. So <laughs> I, don't know, I was just a – man, I was just not a good person. And and, um, and so, yeah, Lennon would just – you know, I, I wish I would have – I just wish I would have been a better person and done it better. But, again, not to the extent where I would give up, you know, sure. the love I have for the Lord and the respect I have for – for him and the amount of forgiveness he's, he's shown me and grace, um, my wife and my kids. I mean, I would not give up any of that for Olympic titles or, or whatever titles, you know? Yeah. So, well, it, it really yeah. speaks to your talent that you were able to, you know, not to glorify it, but be stoned and still, you know, do as well as you did. Um, yeah. because I, you know, I had my problems with pot and it sure didn't uh, make it easier to breathe. Um, you know, when I, when I was, when I was trying to wrestle and, uh, say so it didn't hurt you that way. I guess not because I mean, cause, cause you know, at that time I'm thinking, you know, I'm telling my buddies, I'm like, man, I think it actually helps and it don't help. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's like trying to run your gas on 50% octane and, and yeah, it runs, but what would it run on a hundred percent octane? And that's, you know, which is what I preach to my kids now is like what we put on our body matters. And, um, and yes, I'm probably one of those guys that would tell you that I've smoked a lot of dope. I've sold a lot of dope. And, and, um, I can also tell you that 30, 45, 60 days after stopping smoking dope, um, mentally and physically, I was a much different person. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and and it's crazy because I'm a, I'm an advocate for like medical, um, not smoking, but like, um, you know, I, I, I watched the show, um, on, on, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it now, but uh, uh, Weed the People, W-E-E-D, The People on okay. Netflix. And I'm watching these little six-month-old babies with tumors behind their eye, and they're they're taking uh, – you were a dope smoker. You know what that black resin looks like, and it looks like they're just putting it between their gum. And, and uh, you know, at first the baby's kind of like, whoa, out of it. And then, you know, as the weeks progress, it, it, it kind of um, adjusts to it. And so they're not falling asleep anymore, and, you know, the baby's – tumors gone and a little boy that's got tumors all over his chest, like 60, 70, 80 tumors in his chest over this period of time, um, through using, um, cannabis, um, you know, the tumors are gone. And, um, and so like, I'm an advocate for it on that side, but I'm not an advocate on the, the, um, just making excuses for every, so everybody can just get high because they need it for medical. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. You're just getting high, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I quit drinking about 10 years ago and, and I, I quit smoking pot and all that too. And smoke, quitting smoking was a lot harder for me. You know, I just, I liked how quickly it got you there, got you, you know, got you there and a couple of, couple of hits and your head changed and all that. But and I was the same way. I thought, like, when I wrestled, I'm like, oh, I think I see things better, and I'm not as, you know, whatever. But Oh, absolutely. But I, I, I know now that I would have been so much better had I not done those things. Um, and, and it was weird. When I first quit, I had these just crazy dreams. Um, I don't know if you remember the dreams you had or not, but they were out there. But it, it made me so much better when I quit. I mean, I, I did the math, and I was like, God, I've been high for basically 17 years straight, you know, at that time. And it just, God is good. And I was going to ask you about that. What, what was there a specific moment that, that led you to, um, your faith? Yeah, man. Um, so, uh, in 96, after the national championships, I was making a run down to Arizona and I was, um, 
it was the first trip that I did not make myself. Like I, I, I would drive down and, and pick things up and put it in the car panels or I would strap a kilo to my stomach and fly it home. And, and, um, this was the first time that I wasn't going to make the trip myself. Um, and this group of people that I kind of ran with had convinced me that I should not do it myself anymore because if something happened, you know, we'd lose all contacts with our people and stuff and our supplies. And I was like, okay. So I took a, a friend down there cause that's, you know, what she wanted to do and I took her down there and, um, she set off the metal detector coming through the airport. Oh, wow. And so it was the longest flight of my life back to uh, St. Louis. And um, I got there. I went to the phone like I always would to, to call my brother to come get me. And as I picked up the phone, I had a tap on my shoulder. And I knew. I turned around, and he's like, DEA, you need to come with us. Okay. And so, um, you know, they I didn't have anything on me. And um, – you know, they, I played the, the wrestling card. I was like, man, I'm just a wrestler. I was just down there with a friend of mine and, you know, I, I lied something fierce and, and, um, and they're like, okay, you know, and, but they, they caught on, they knew who I was selling it to. They knew who I was getting it from. And, and, um, so you fast forward a little bit and, uh, I mean, the DA had my wife's parents' phones tapped and, and cause she was living with them and pregnant with our daughter and, and, um, and so it was, she goes into labor about six and a half, seven weeks early with our daughter. And I had just gotten back to Kansas city from seeing her in St. Louis. And I got a phone call from my mom. I had just gotten to work and my, my uh, mom calls me and says, I just got a phone call. They're taking Jody to the, uh, uh, ER. Um, she's in labor. They don't think the baby's going to make it. And I'm telling you, Tim, I knew right then, um, I knew, I knew it was, it was because of me and the the lifestyle that I had been leading. And I'm in the back room at this, uh, at this restaurant and I dropped down to my knees and I just said, Lord, if you're going to take somebody, man, take me because, um, this is all my fault. I said, um, but Jody and that baby don't deserve, uh, they don't deserve this because of me. So if, if you're going to take somebody, take me. And I literally was on my knees with my arms up and, uh, it kind of sounds, I'm sure silly to someone who doesn't know, but. I literally thought he was going to light me up right there. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm waiting for a lightning bolt to come through that roof and just snatch me off this earth and deservingly. So, and, um, and I sat there for a second and nothing happened. And I, I kind of stood up and I said, if you could give me one more chance, I will live for you. I don't know how, but I'll live for you and I'll tell people about you. And, um, about that time, my mom pulls up back and honks. I run out the restaurant, jump in the truck, uh, in her car. And I drove from Kansas city to, uh, the hospital in South St. Louis. I don't think I did under a hundred the whole way. And not one time did I see a cop. I mean, literally just blew across I 70 and we get there and, um, I, I, I go in the hospital and, and, uh, they said, look, we're, we're trying to hold off the, the delivery. We're going to take her by C-section tomorrow at seven thirty or at eight thirty. But I'm just telling you, be prepared that she's not going to make it. And if she does, she's probably going to have some brain damage. And I just said, God, you, you can't do this. You can't punish her. Not, not because of me. And, um, she's 24 years old, beautiful project manager for a, a company down in, um, Joplin and, uh, loves the Lord. Um, work, you know, works for the company and also works for her, um, church and does missionary trips. And, um, and so, um, as she got born and she was fine, we were living in Columbia and, uh, you know, we would go up, uh, Brett was wrestling at Mizzou and I was, I, I would work out with Sammy and, and Brett and some of the MU guys. And, and I was kind of coaching down at Kemper and the DA was still all over me. And, um, you know, most people go, well, you must've told something. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm telling you, you, you can, you can ask the people they knew I was getting it from and giving it to, um, I never, I never said anything because believe it or not, Tim, I couldn't, I couldn't reason why I would get, get to get away by telling when I was doing the same things they were doing, why would they not, you know, why, why me and not them? Yeah. And so I couldn't do it. And, um, I was coaching and, um, uh, I got a phone call about a week before I got saved. I'd gone to this church, this, this football player at Kemper invited me to come to his church. 
And uh, I don't know why, man, I went because uh, I'd always kind of bashed Christians and and because of, you know, because you know, I, I, he asked me, he goes, well, how come you don't go to church? I said, well, let me ask you something, man. What are you? He's like, what do you mean? I said, well, what are you? Are you Baptist, Catholic, Methodist? Right. Because all you guys think you're right. But there's supposedly just one Jesus. And he kind of laughs. He goes, no, man. He goes, we're just non-denominational. We're just Christians, man. We're just trying to be Christ-like. And I was like, I didn't even know that existed. Yeah. I didn't know that was an option, you know. And he says, yeah. He goes, you ought to come check it out. I don't know why, but I, I ended up going Sunday uh, to the church and and um, I sat in back and it was awesome. Um, it moved me, but I, I didn't know why. I didn't know how. And I went home and and um, I was I I left and went to St. Louis to see uh, my daughter and, and Jody. And I was laying on the bed talking, you know, playing with the baby, and, and the phone rang, and it was the DA. And he said, "Hey, man, here's the deal. We're we're tired of messing with you." And I was like. Okay. And I go, what's that mean? He goes, here's the deal. He goes, you got one week. You tell us what we want to know, or we'll be up next week to pick you up. And we're going to charge you with four counts of uh, trafficking kilos. So you're looking at about 40 years. Wow. And I just said, okay, man. I said, that's fair enough. And so I hung up and I'm looking at my daughter, Brett. I named her after my brother. And, and, um, and I didn't, t- I didn't say nothing to Jody cause I didn't want her, you know, freaked out. And I just went back to Columbia and and uh, that weekend Jody and Brett were gone and so I knew somehow I had to go back to that church and uh, I, I went back out to this church in in Fulton Missouri um, I'm sitting in the back of the church and you know um, I, I hate using the, I hate I hate the fact I even say this but it was predominantly a black church Have you ever been to one uh, <laughs> and, I mean, uh, no, the music I, actually, and, yeah, I mean, I, it's just off the chart. Awesome. Right. Yeah. And the, and the brother that invited me was the praise and worship leader. I mean, he's like six, three, 275 pounds. Cause he played at Kemper and, and 90, uh, seven or 98 Kemper is like number one offense or number one defense in the country. Number two offense. I mean, they were phenomenal, um, guys that played at Oklahoma state, Baylor, Oregon, um, Terrence Marshall played for Bob Stoops his first year that he won the national title. He was our inside linebacker and then linebacker in Oklahoma. So they were awesome. So he was the praise and worship leader. And, um, and so I'm standing in the back of this church and they're jamming and everybody's, you know, having a great time worshiping. And, and I, I'm just kind of standing there and all of a sudden the music stops. And the gentleman that, in, that invited me, his brother was a, a deacon at the church and he, 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 he was in the front row, first seat, and he steps up, he grabs the microphone, and I kind of look up like, what's going on? And I know it sounds crazy, man, but um, he says, if you go back out there this week, if you go back out there without the blood of my son covering you, you will die and the enemy will win. If you go back out there this week without the son, the blood of my son. And I am – never have I before uh, since then or before – but I saw his mouth move, but I hear the voice of God speaking to me. Yeah. And he literally, he puts the microphone down, turns around, sets down, the music goes back. And I, I start looking around like, what the hell just happened? And, and who else heard that? And I sit in the back, the rest of the service and the service is over and everybody's hugging and kissing and saying goodbye. And I'm in, I'm in tears, man. I'm sitting in the back of this pew and I'm, I'm crying because I'm terrified to leave this little church. And the, the, the gentleman that introduced me or invited me comes up and he goes, Hey man, you okay? And I kind of look up and I said, Hey man, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know really for sure what's going on here. I said, but I'm telling you right now, I'm not leaving without this Jesus. I said, so somebody needs to help me. And he kind of looks at me and, and he kind of looks back. He goes, was that for you? And I, and I'm, I, I must've been, as white as a ghost, man. Because I, when he said that, I was like, no way. He, he heard it too. And, and I said, um, I said, man, don't play no games with me. I said, um, I don't speak the, your Christianese, but I'm not leaving without Jesus. And he just said, that's the easy part. And he walks me up to the front and uh, pastor opens the Bible to Romans 10, 9. And he says, read, read this chapter. So I read Romans and, and gets the part, you know, where he says that anybody who believes and confesses with their mouth um, and believes in their heart will be saved, neither Jew nor Gentile. And, um, 
And he just looks at me and goes, do you believe that? Man, brother, I had, I had hardly ever read the Bible. When we were kids traveling around with our schoolboy teams and cadet teams, you know, you're in the hotel and you open and there's the Gideon's Bible and you read it and you're like, I know that looks like English, but that sounds like Japanese or something, right? Because yeah. I don't understand it. Yeah. I read that that day and beyond the shadow of a doubt, I knew that that it was the truth. And he said, do you believe it? And I said, Pastor, I, I said, I don't even know why, but I, I know, I know, I know it's the truth. And he said, do you want to accept Christ as your Savior today? And I said, absolutely. And he said, do you want to repent of all your sins? I said, absolutely. And I mean, literally, I'm 25 years old. And it's the first time I think I ever stood up straight. You know, that old saying of the, the weight of the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. And I I literally knew that day what that, that meant. And um, so I... I got saved that day in that church, and and um, he, I, as I was leaving, he says to me, Tim. He says, um, "Now I want you to I want you to understand something. The enemy's going to come at you like he's never come at you before." And I was like, "What do you mean?" He goes, "I'm just telling you. Keep your eyes open." He goes, "And here's the second thing." He said, "The word of God does not lie. It, it doesn't change." He said, "I'm a human. I would never want to mislead you, but I'm capable." When you go home, you start in the book of Matthew and you start and you ask him to reveal himself to you. And then you start reading chapter by chapter, wherever you stop, the next day you pick up. I said, okay, so those two things stuck. I got home that day. Nobody was home. I got home that day and uh, I sat down and the phone rang. And I remember that's back before cell phones. um, And I remember looking at it and, and all I could think about was, the devil's on that, on that phone. And I picked up the phone and it was the guy that I would get stuff from. And I hadn't talked to him since all the stuff happened. And, um, he said, Hey man, what's up? And I was like, Ponzi. I said, uh, nothing, man. What's up? And he goes, nothing. He said, you good? I said, yeah. He goes, you need anything? And I, I go, no, man. I said, I'm good. I said, I, I, I said, Ponzi, I, I'm done, man. I'm out. And he just kind of laughed. He said, okay. And he hung up. And so I hung up. As I got ready to sit down, the phone rang, and I popped right back up, and I knew it was him, and I grabbed it, and I said, hello, and he said, uh, hey, we're going to be coming through. We'll just drop it off. Now, I'm telling you, Tim, the whole time I've been dealing dope, nobody made it easy. I had I had girls at Iowa State that I would have stuff shipped to in their name, and then I would go get it. I had – we would go get it and fly it back, or we would FedEx it, or we would drive down, and it was never easy. Yeah. And when he said that, I mean, it like, it spooked me. Like I, I was like, no, man. I said, seriously, man, I'm out. I'm done. He said, okay. And hung up and I never talked to him again. Never spoke to him again to this day. And, um, and so I started reading the word because I wanted to, um, I wanted to find a loophole, um, so that I could go back to Dylan dope and, and, you know, and the more I read it, the more it just, it just, he just revealed himself to me and I knew that I knew that it was the truth. I knew it was the way. Um, and so man, I mean, it just, it changed me. Um, I, I would still, so I would still get high a little bit after I got saved, but it was different. Like I would go work all day coaching. Then when I came home, I'd be fixing dinner and I'd have a couple hits off a joint. And in my mind, I would say, you know, it's no different than a guy that comes home and has a couple of beers. You know, this is more natural, you know, than, than alcohol. And I would keep telling myself that. And then I got to um, 1 Corinthians when it talks about your body becomes a temple that the Holy Spirit dwells within. And so when you sin against your body, you're sinning against the, the, the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you, man, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I thought after all he did for me, this is how I'm going to treat him by getting high. Yeah. I walked over to the drawer. I took out a, a pipe, a bag of weed. I threw it in the trash. I told my brother, I told Jody and everybody, I said, no more smoking weed in my house. We don't watch this kind of movies. We don't listen to this kind of music. Anything that's not, um, you know, that's of the depth, I'm, we're not doing it. And, I mean, that quick, I, and I was done. I was I was done that quick. That's an, that's an awesome story. It gave me chills there at the end when you were talking about it. Um, and, and I, you know, it's weird. When I quit drinking, um I used to make a sauna in the bathroom. I was telling this on the Dennis Hall podcast, but I used to make a sauna in the bathroom. I'd wake up at 6 a.m. and I'd be so anxious. And uh, no matter what time I went to bed, I'd wake up at 6 a.m. on the, on the you know, and 
I went in the bathroom and I stuck a towel under the hotel room door and I turned up the hot water so I could kind of sweat it out and jump around and and uh, I sat on the side of the tub and I was I was I was saying God please help me stop doing this to myself and dude I heard an audible voice say help yourself and Woo! and it was like the only two words I needed to hear as far as like it was like God saying I have given you everything you need to be successful, to be happy, to be fulfilled. It's all inside of you already. I've already given it to you. So if you want to stop doing that to yourself, stop doing that to yourself. <laughs> You're the only one who can stop, you know. That's simple, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I would like to say that I've been perfect since then, and but I definitely have not been, and I, I, I waver sometimes. And a, a therapist told me one time, she said, you can't hear God when you're effed up, you know, and, Amen. and, and that made a lot of sense to me. Um, and, and I've fallen off the wagon here and there with, with pot, but I've, it never, it never makes me happy for more than a couple days, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm in the middle myself of trying to be a better Christian, like read the Bible and try to understand it. And, and, uh, so that was a big reason that I wanted to have you on here is cause I, I, I need to hear from people who who have lived that kind of lifestyle and and you know it's important for people to know that they can come back from anything and and that kind of leads me into what I wanted to talk about with your comeback because I used to tell myself all the time I'd be running after I was getting sober and I'd be telling myself God loves a comeback and every time I would say that it would it gave me chills just now saying it you know yeah. God loves a comeback and uh so that kind of leads me into what your comeback in, in 99, where you ended up eighth at the U.S. Open. Um, tell me how that, what led to that. How long had you been off the mat when you decided to do that? Well, probably not really off the mat because I was coaching at Kemper, so I was wrestling every day with those guys. And then, um, and then uh, Sam, <clears throat> at that time, Sammy was assistant up at um, Mizzou. Okay. So Sammy and I would do one-on-one -on -one workouts and then – you know, he'd always let us come in and work out with the guys and stuff. And so I was, I was on the mat doing that kind of stuff. Um, but then, um, 90, uh, 98, after I was at Kemper, uh, a buddy of mine that I'd, I'd known, um, from, he, he was a NAI guy too, Terry Pack. He runs legends of gold up in, um, uh, Dakotas. Um, Terry calls me and says, Hey man, um, come to Neosho County and help me start this program. And I was like, I'm open. So I drive down, I meet with him, I meet with the Dean of students and, and, um, uh, and he kind of lays out the vision and, and, uh, and I said, so all I have to do is wrestle with these guys every day and train. And, um, he's like, yeah. And so, um, I was like, man, that's gonna be tough to beat. And he, he told me that he was bringing in Bogdan and Ariel Cefalescu from Romania okay. who, um, Ariel was the 90, I think he was fourth behind brands in them in 93 or, uh, 93, I think. Okay. And then, um, Ariel or Bogdan, his brother was the 96 Olympian in that weight class, um, behind Kendall Cross and them. And so, um, and then I talked to him, I said, well, what about my brother? And he's like, yeah. I, I was like, well, what about Ironman? He's like, hell yeah. <laughs> so that was, we were all down there coaching and training and, um, Terry did a great job of recruiting. We had a bunch, I mean, we were seventh our first year at the junior college nationals. So we had hammers to work out with. And I mean, obviously we didn't really even need them if we just looked around the room with Brett and Mike and Bogdan and Ariel and me. And, and, um, so man, I just started training really hard and, um, felt really good. And, um, uh, I, uh, I, I was, I was buddies with Brian Elam and, and Brian was like, Hey man, um, you know, do you, you, would you want to go? And I was like, yeah. And so, you know, Elon bought me a plane ticket and, and a hotel room and I was training and, you know, like I, I would, I would take three, four days off, uh, at, at Neosho and I would drive up and I'd, I'd crash on Aiken's couch and work out. And, um, and then I would, uh, Aiken would be, you know, he'd be like, Hey, we're going out to the Olympic training center for a, a, a training camp. So I would drive out there and sleep in my car and, and practice. And then, um, I, I called KJ, um, you know, Kevin Jackson. I said, KJ, you know, you think I could come out and, 
He's like, yeah, man. He goes, I can, I can get you in, you know, you know, the food table, but I don't know that we have any rooms. And I was like, doesn't matter. I'll figure it out. And so, you know, I would hang out with the guys and, and, um, um, and then when it's time to go to bed, I just, I'd go sleep in my car and, and, um, shower and stuff there. I mean, it was all, I mean, it was, it, to me, it was just what I had to do, you yeah. know? And, um, so I was just out there training and, and felt good. And, and, um, I mean, literally the best shape I'd ever been in. Um, and I know it sounds crazy because you're like, well, you only got eighth. I'm like, well, it was still the best I'd ever been was, was that year. And, you know, I lost to, um, I think my only loss that year was to Kerry Bowman's. Um, and so I was like, well, and then I, I think I, I ended up injury default in the seventh place match. Cause, uh, after the Bowman's match, my ear looked like I had another head on the side of my, and I mean, it, it yeah. was, and I was like, and my mistake was I thought the top eight got to go to the trials. Okay. So I was like, well, what the hell do I care? I'm, I'm going to go to the trials anyway. Um, so I injury defaulted, um, and, and then found out that I w- they weren't going to let me go to the Olympic trials, but, um, it is what it is. But, um, so yeah, man, I mean, that was, that was it. I mean, and, and the thing is, is it was just, I don't know, man, I, I got to, um, I saw coach Douglas there. Um, I, I had beaten, um, Dwight Henson at the, at the U S open that year, Danny Felix and those guys. And, you know, they were some kiss kids or uh, some kiss guys. And, and, um, you know, I always wanted to apologize to coach Douglas, um, because, I felt like, you know, I was wrong, you know, and, and, yeah. and uh, not to say that him or coach Gibbons never made any mistakes, but I was going to own it. And so um, at the end of that tournament, I, I saw coach Douglas, he was leaning against the rail and I walked over and I just said, Hey coach, I said, um, man, I just want you to know that I'm sorry about everything I did. And, and um, I want you to know that I'm, my life's changed and, and, and I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to be okay. And he just kind of looked at me and I, I was just like, Okay. And I walked off and I was like, it wasn't for you anyway. It was for me. So, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, and so, yeah, I had a great tournament. I, you know, I, I, I beat some guys and, and I, I really thought that if I could have got to the trials again, not saying sure. anything would happen, but I think Bowman's was fifth at the U S open and, and then fast forward to the trials and he loses to Terry in the, yeah. in the, uh, in the finals. And, um, but I mean, Bowman's and I, I mean, we had some great battles and, and, um, you know, I'd go out to the training center and, and, um, I would absorb anything I could from, um, from everybody that I could work out with or, um, uh, coaches, um, at one point, um, um, oh, the national team coach at the time, the Olympic coach, Bruce Burnett, I'm working out and I'm hitting this leg lace and he comes over, he taps me on the shoulders. He goes, Williams, where you been? <laughs> and I was like, I was embarrassed, but I looked up and I'm like, trying to get myself out of trouble, coach. And he goes, you need to be here. I'm like, yeah, I know, but I got a wife and two kids and no money and I can't just move out here. I knew, I knew I needed to be out there, but I'm like, yeah, that's easier said than done. Um, and so I, I couldn't do it. And I went home and, um, next year I tried to train for the, for, for it, but it just, just was different, man. I, yeah. I, I lost my window and, and it was fine. I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, I think about all the guys in this country that can't say that they've been the top eight, at the U S open or, yeah. or I look at the guys that placed ahead of me at that U S open. I'm like pretty impressive resume. Yeah. Um, but, um, shoot, man. I mean, a lot of guys can, I, and I always think, man, what if I was the eighth best pitcher in the major leagues or the eighth best quarterback? <laughs> Yeah. Eighth, eighth best. I would have never had money problems. I could have trained for the rest of my life, but yeah. you know, it is what it is. And I, I came home and, and I was tired of being poor and broke all the time. And my wife was working full time and I was trying to train two to three times a day. And so I just came home and I just said, man, it's, I guess it's time for me to kind of grow up. And I started a business and 20 years later, I mean, Lord's blessed me and I, you know, it's all yeah. good. Yeah. So, it's a great story, and and yeah, people people might people don't realize people the casual fan doesn't realize how freaking awesome that is, you know, to uh, yeah. be in the top seven or eight in the in the at the U.S. Open. It's as you know, very. I wanted to ask you about your relationship with Aiken. What made him so? What made him so tough, Eric Aiken? Um, mentally, uh. Aiken just had this ability to want to win. I mean, like, 
like, you know, it could tell you he liked to party. That wasn't my style, but, but like I had teammates at Iowa state, man, that, I mean, they could party like rock stars on Monday and Tuesday, we'd be in a duel and they'd be, I mean, they like, you couldn't tell me. I was like, I'd be a train wreck after, you know, that just wasn't my way, but, um, I tried to make it my way, but it, 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 you know, it wasn't. And, um, but, uh, I don't know. I, I, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of to do with Aiken was just, I mean, I, Aiken always likes to tell everybody I was his first match that, that he ever wrestled, um, that I, I beat him. I, and I don't, I don't think he's ever introduced me and not said Rick was my first match and he beat me, you know? And so, <laughs> um, I don't know, man, we just always hit it off. I mean, um, and just his, his, his ability to train and, and mentally be checked in. Um, I mean, that's the reason he's a four-time All-American. Um, that's the reason why, you know, him and Steph had Jake at a, at a, why we were still in college and he didn't, it didn't derail him. He didn't go, Oh, well, um, I guess I'll just have to drop out and get a job. You know, I mean, um, um, Steph stood by him and his parents and her parents stood by him and, and, um, you know, mentally he was just like, no, man, I'm not, I'm not giving into it. I'm just going to keep battling and I'm going to keep uh, j- chasing my dreams. And, and, um, and, it, and it just worked. And, um, so I don't know. He was, he's one of the rare guys that I've had the, the pleasure of training with and being around much that, um, like, you know, Aiken called me right now and said, I need you. I, I'd run down there in a heartbeat and, yeah. um, I'd be there for him, man. I mean, I, I consider him like a brother, you know? And so, yeah, I don't know, man. I just, it just, he's just always been one of those guys that I've just always loved and, and, and felt like he has a, um, I mean, if you know anything about Aiken too, no matter how much he partied or, or, or was that person for a while, man, that dude had a genuine heart, man. And I think that's probably something that, um, I look at people's hearts, man. I mean, like, um, you know, if you want to judge me for the person that I've been then, and you don't look at my heart, that's your loss, not mine. And so Aiken's one of those brothers that I've just always looked at his heart and, and thought, man, um, this is a guy that I could trust and I could, you know, train with and, and live with and, and spend time with. And I did spend a lot of time with him and, and, um, he'll always have my, uh, utmost respect. Cool. Um, how, do you ever waver in your faith at all anymore? Like, do you ever get in a, in a, in a funk or get away from reading the Bible or, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Cause I'm human. Um, I think the biggest thing for me, like, like, I don't know that I could tell you that my funk would be like, um, maybe I've skipped days or weeks of reading the word or, um, but like to, to say that I'm just going to go back to just being worldly and, 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 uh, denounce the Lord. I couldn't even tell you. I'm, I don't know that. I don't know if that's ever been the case, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah. the way he shook me from the from looking at forty years in prison, or and I mean, I've had guns pulled on me, and and all these things, and then and then, you know, I mean, I, you know, I murdered one of my, my firstborn child. I mean, I paid to have murdered, and he forgave me for that, man. I'm like, who does that? And then and then, how do I how do I ever reconcile turning my back on him after what he's done for me? Yeah. So. No, I mean, like, like I, I tell people, you know, people ask me, like, you know, my brother said, well, you know, why are you on Facebook? And I'm like, man, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a way for me to share the, the word. And, um, and, uh, you know, he's like, people ask, well, you know, so you do that for people. And I'm like, no, I mean, it may, it may come across like I'm doing it for people, but if I'm being honest, man, it's my shoreline. It's, it's, it's for me because I ran a home fellowship for 10 years. Um, I, I did a men's study um, on the kingdom man book. Um, and I used to tell my, my, the people that I would do those things with is, um, you, you guys help make me a better man because every day I have to try to be a better Christian or how could I ever set before you and try to teach the word or share the word or, you know, uh, advise somebody on how to be a better Christian man. If I'm not, if I'm not doing it myself and, I spent plenty of time in the sport of wrestling doing it the right way. You know, when I was at the junior nationals, um, in, in, um, 89 and 90, I won it in 89. I lost to Bobby Janice. I, I, uh, I beat him in the, in the early rounds and lost to him in the finals. 
but even though I lost that match in 89, I won and in 90, I, I, I get second. I knew I deserved to win because I knew I had done the work in, in, uh, 87, when I made the world team, I beat Sam Dolly high, who was a, I think a junior national runner up the year before as a freshman. Um, I beat him four one in the finals and, and everybody's like, Oh man, you got a tall task ahead of you. I'm like, no way, man, I've trained for this. I am prepared. I know I deserve to win this. Well, I kind of look at faith the same way. I mean, I, I mean, I listened to an un, crazy amount of teachings during the days and, and, and Christian music and, and, and by no means, Tim, <laughs> I'm still so far from perfect. It ain't even funny. Ask my wife or my kids or any of my close friends. They're like, Oh yeah, he'll lose it in a second and say things he shouldn't or, <laughs> or, you know, stuff. But, um, I, then I laugh, I go, yeah, well then imagine what I'd be like if I didn't have the Lord. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cause I'd be a whole different level of a train wreck. Um, but so yeah, for me, it's, um, it's just trying to, um, trying to be better and closer to him because, uh, man, as the world starts to spin more and more out of control, um, I want to be on my father's lap, just like, I, you know, our kids want to be on our laps when, when they're little, you know, I'm like, well, you know, my father is the king of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Why would I not want to be like right next to him? Like, dad, you see what's going on? You got me. And he's like, yeah, I got you, man. So, um, so as far as wavering in my faith, I mean, there's times where I've gone where I haven't read the word or, you know, a few days where maybe I haven't been in the scripture or my daily devotional or a teaching. But, um, but when I tell you about two or three days, I'm like, I got to get in. I got to get in, you know, and then I'll I'll do two or three posts of making stuff up. So if you ever see like this morning, um, we were camping this weekend. So um, I didn't I didn't post anything for two or three days. And so this morning I posted like three or four posts with you know, my devotionals and just some thoughts on them. Um, and again, if that helps somebody, then awesome. If it yeah. doesn't, it helps me and I'm good with that too. So, yeah. How, how would you describe, uh, the devil to somebody? Because it seems to me like whenever I do, uh, make an effort, especially to get close to God and I feel close to God and everything. Um, snake, Satan seems to be very sneaky. Like, like, what about this guy who said this? Or, hey, look at this girl. Or, you know, all these things, you know. Um, it, it's weird. How would you describe Satan to people? Like, is it a force or is it a... Um, I kinda... describe him as pastors. I describe him as movie stars, musicians, politicians, you, me, all of us, whenever we let him influence us or, um, unfortunately for some... Um, possess us, you know? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always honest with people before I got saved, I was just a puppet for Satan. Um, now, I mean, you know, you say it to the wrong people and they probably think you're, you're off your rocker, but I'm like, Oh, I have that battle going on in my head daily. Satan yeah. is constantly coming at me. Like, you know, like, um, like I always tell my girls, look, um, you know, a short shirt and yoga pants. no, no, man, that's you. you I mean, that puts too many options in men's men's brain standing behind you in line or walking up the stairs behind you. I said, just I mean, we don't need that kind of temptation. So so I'm asking you girls, don't do those things. Um, I don't I don't uh, I, I try not to put myself in a, a, a situations like um, when I was dealing dope, I'd always say. Uh, I got a, a quote from the movie Heat. He said, don't ever be so tied to anything that if you see the heat coming around the corner that you can't leave it or drop it and be gone in 60 seconds. And so um, uh, I remember after getting saved, we were living in Columbia, and um, I went to the bar with with um, um, all the guys, you know, probably Brett and Sammy and Brent and a bunch of us were there. And I remember being at the bar, and I remember thinking – I was so out of place now. I, like it just felt different, like, like not good. And I just watched, I was watching people thinking, what am I doing? And we're leaving. And there's this group of girls that they're, they're looking at us and they're like, Hey, come over to our place, come over to our place. And I remember thinking that that was Satan. I mean, I've got a, I've got a, uh, I've got a baby at home 
with my soon to be wife. And I don't know what, well, I have a pretty good idea what could happen if I go over here. And I just remember, and I just, that, that, that part of that movie jumped in my mind. I'm like, you got to see Satan coming from around the corner and you got to run. And so I just remember saying, no, man, I'm good. And, um, and I went, I went home that night and I mean, it was just gradually growing in those kinds of things where I could see Satan in them. And, and, um, and so, um, as I tell my kids and, and my wife and, and my friends that, you know, that we do studies with and stuff that, that I'm close to, I'm like, man, we got to check all things against the word, uh, against with prayer and with wise counsel, you know, so we got to go to brothers and be like, Hey, you know, what do you think? And then how does that line up with scripture and, and does it line up in prayer? And if those things kind of line up, you're probably, you're probably in the, in the will of God. If something doesn't, then maybe we need to rethink that, you know, maybe we need to seek some counsel or, or, or maybe we need to go to the scriptures and see what it says about it and stuff. So, um, so how do I explain Satan to people? I'm like, um, you know, God says, it, I think best that, you know, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. And so then I look around and I go, well, what's the world? Yeah. You know, I mean, advertising says, you know, you're not really, you know, you don't get hot chicks unless you're drinking Bud Light. You know, that's what the commercials say. And, and, um, you know, and if you're not skinny and half naked, then, you know, you're not attractive to men. And, uh, I, I say, well, man, that's all, that's all Satan putting that poison yeah. in us. And so I battle him every day, man. I wake up every day and, you know, I, I was at, I was at lunch today work, I work out, try to work out for my lunch. And so I'm at the gym working out. And, um, I used to love my old gym. It was a YMCA. It was the old YMCA. Well, it was the old one. So the workout room was downstairs in like a dungeon, but guess what? Um, half naked girls hardly ever came there to work out cause it wasn't cool. Yeah, it was awesome. Well, it closed, and now we have to go to the new Y, which is more like a strip mall. And so you've got girls in there. I mean, like they got painted on pants, you know. And and I'm just like, Satan's like, look. And I'm like, are you kidding me? No. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm in that battle with him today at working out. He's like, look. I'm like, nope. He's like, look. Are you kidding me? Look at that. Who doesn't look at that? I'm like, nope. Yeah. Nope. Get out of here, Satan. Get out of here. And I. And I just call him out like that because I think that's what the word of God tells us to do. Yeah. Right. I mean, when well, I, I started reading the word of God, Tim, I looked at it and I asked my pastor, I said, when we start doing this stuff, he's, <laughs> he's healing people and raising people from the dead and casting out demons. When do we do that? And he kind of looked at me like, what do you mean? I go, well, it's in the word of God. How come we, how come we're not still doing it? Yeah. You know? And yeah. so I, I see it all. I feel it all the time. You know, sometimes I'll be feeling good and then all of a sudden I'll start getting angry about something somebody said or whatever. And I'll find myself having these thoughts and I'm like, I see what you're doing. You sneaky bastard, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's good. Oh, he's he great. Good. Oh. Right now in this world today, when you just look at our country and the stuff that we're going through right now, the division over skin and not sin over red or blue, I'm, I just look back and go, if, if, if you're a Christian and you do not see Satan pulling the strings like he is right now, brother, you're missing it. He is good. Um, but I always tell people, but just remember, at the end of the day, if we're truly believers um, in Christ, I don't care what the scoreboard says when the final buzzer sounds. We, will, we are on the winning team. Yeah. So, you know, but... Man, it sure don't feel like it some days, brother. Yeah, I, I know. I, I ask God all the time. I'm like, Satan wants me. Please keep him away from me, you know, as best I can. And and I, I'm I'm trying to get better at it all the time, especially for my boy. And, you know, I just want to be, I figure if I, if I raise him the right way, everything else will fall into place. And, you know, I'm, I, I really uh, I'm glad I got to talk to you. And don't be surprised if I call you sometime because I have questions about, a lot of things in the Bible and, and, you know, well, yeah, I was raised. I promise to... you this. I may not always have the answers, but I got some pretty good men that, um, are extremely schooled in the word of God. And so to this day, I still call them and go, okay, I, I, I'm stuck on this. Help me out here. What, what's your thoughts here? Um, but anytime brother, I mean, that's, I mean, Jesus is a game changer, man. And, and I hope everybody gets, it. and I don't mean that, um, that bumper on that bumper sticker on the car or that tag on your Instagram or Twitter. I mean, literally get him, 
life changing, repentant. Um, you know, I mean, I, I don't think most people even understand that repentance is to turn 180 away from, right? I, I think a lot of Christians in this day and age, they go, they go to church or that building on Sundays and they sit in that pew and they check the box. If we're at lunch afterwards and you ask half of them, they wouldn't be able to tell you what they talked about that day. Yeah. And um, I always tell my wife, we don't go to a church where the pastor doesn't say, okay, open your Bible to Matthew 18 today. That's where we're going to be. I walk into church and that pastor doesn't say open the word, open the Bible to a, to a scripture and that's where he's at. I've yeah. got no interest in that church, man. Yeah, our, our pastor passed away a few years ago and, and it's been hard to find somebody since then out here that... that uh, kind of fills your soul, you know, um, and so that's, that's been a challenge, and, um, I'll let you get out of here, but are, are your, your children your greatest joys in your life? Nope. Okay. Nope. The Lord. <laughs> Lord, okay. Lord's one, my wife's two, and my children are three, man, and then whatever after that, I guess work and family, our friends and stuff, but, um, you know, I tell my girls all the time, don't ever fall in love with the man that will love you more than he loves God because it's a recipe for tough times and potentially a disaster. And, um, so I, I mean, I try to tell my girls and my wife, you know, I, I, you know, I think they kind of know the kind of man I, I'm trying to be. And, and they know that, um, um, you know, my wife and I, the only thing we usually fight about is our kids because I'm probably a little hard on them. Um, um, but then she hates it when they come back later and they're like, dad, you were right. And she, and she's like, I'm like, well, I told you, <laughs> you know? Um, but, um, but yeah, man, I, I mean, I want my kids to know I love you, but if it comes between you and him, I'm taking him every day of the week. Um, my oldest daughter, at, um, when she got to high school, thought she thought she knew better than, you know, I did on how to run our home. And, um, so one night I, I got her stuff and I, I said, well, go upstairs and get a, get a change of underwear and bra and socks and a pair of pants and a shirt and a pair of shoes and put them in a bag. And so she goes and gets them. She comes down and she's like, now what? I go, now get in the car because I'm taking you to the orphanage. Wow. He's like, what? I go, babe, it will break my heart. But if you think you know better on how to run this house, then you get to go do it on your own, but you're not going to do it at my house. In my house... God is the rule, and we're going to live to the best of our ability. And if you don't want to, babe, I get it. You have that choice, but not under my roof because i got to stand before him one day on how I raised you, how I led your mother, how I, I led this house, and um, you're not going to do that here. And um, oh, thank God she didn't go. Yeah. And, um, and we've had a phenomenal relationship really ever since then. And, and uh, I mean, those days, man, Tim, she's sending me two or three teachings um, just devouring the word. And I'm like, man, girl, I can't even keep up with you. Um, when my girls got older and got out of school, um, I, I was kind of like, well, now what do I do? How do I know that they're still in the word or doing the things? So I started sending them, like I said, well, that's fine. You're in college. You, you're not here to go to church with us or to have fi family study. I said, but I'm going to send you every week. I'm going to send you at least one or two teachings or, and then I want you to listen to them. And I said, girls, just amuse me, write two or three things down. And at least I know you listen to it right to this day, Tim. And I, this is really, this is all God patting me on the back, um, for something that he did. Um, I've yet to have my girls send me anything less than two or three pages of notes wow. on every teaching or scripture that I send them. And, um, now that doesn't mean that they do it like, you know, joyfully or, you know, but, or, but they do it. And, um, and, um, man, I mean, it, as a dad, I'm telling you, brother, training up a child could not be more important in the way of the Lord. Doesn't mean that they're always going to stay. Doesn't mean they're always going to listen and follow. But I trust the word, and the word says that if you train them up, you know, they will return to what they know. And so, man, I hold on to that scripture dearly. Um, but, yeah, man, just uh, I would – the only other thing I would say is if you're trying to, you know, is – Find, you know, find a couple other families. That's what we did. We noticed that we were spending a lot of time with two or three families that our kids played sports with. And I just went to them and said, I think we need to start, start a study. And um, if, if not, then our family is probably going to kind of go our own way and, and find some other families. And, and what a blessing because all families were like, yeah, we're in. And so we ran that study for 
10 years. We went through the whole New Testament, um, start to finish, scripture by scripture. Um, and I would, I think every family would tell you that the impact it had on our kids. And some of our kids were, when I first started that, my Jade is uh, just turned 20. And she must have started that. And she must have been six and six or seven. Every time we had a family, uh, the families came together to study the word. She'd be right there. And people would be like, well, sometimes they're sleeping, not paying attention. I'm like, the word of God says, blessed is he who reads and blessed is he who hears the word. I said, this is one time where I think osmosis works. These kids are getting it because worst case scenario, they're seeing us as parents breaking bread, reading the word of God. That's got to be worth something. Yeah. So I tell young people all the time, I'm like, man, if you're going to have a family, find two or three other families you spend a lot of time with. I said, I'm not interested in the country club on Sundays. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in people that you can do life with that can hold you accountable you hold them accountable and your village raises, raises your children. Cause I think it's a game changer to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I can't tell you how much I appreciate you talking to me. It, it makes me want to be uh, better. And the, the, the more that I've been trying to get closer to God, the more people he's been putting in my life that, you know, Amen. in my path that are, are of the same mindset. And it, it is hard in this day and age where we, like I just I just had Coach Ryan, Coach Tom Ryan from the Ohio State Ooh. on my podcast, and he was talking about how uh, how important it is to to. Uh, I'm sorry, I got kind of I got so many things in my head. I'm uh, getting lost yeah, in what brother. I'm saying. But um, he was talking about how you know God forgives you for all the things that you've done, and if you just turn to Him, it'll all work out. And and uh, all these people have been putting in my in my life lately that have been helping me because we're, that's what I was going to say. We're in a world that is so dependent on likes and all that other crap that doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything, you know. And and I I I'm embarrassed at how how much it bothers me when somebody says things to me, you know, that all I all I was trying to do was say something at, at, to bring us together, and they they crap on it, and it, it bothers me. And and all I can really do is. Pray for him and then do the best I can for me and my own family. You know, misery loves company. Yeah. Oh gosh. I mean, well, think about. It. I posted a couple of weeks ago the one that says, um, uh, "I'd rather I'd rather walk alone for truth than walk with a group and and it not be the truth." Or so I can't remember how it went, but I saw it last I night. Mean, that's that's probably the one thing that the Lord has showed me is at the end of the day, and and I joke. I used to joke with my wife all the time, like, look. As long as I got the Lord, I mean, I, I obviously I want my wife and my kids, but I can live without probably anything as long as I got him. Yeah. And my, I'm, and you know, and and so I, I joke with my wife. I'm like, yeah, as long as it's me and you and the Lord. If everything else and nobody else wants to be our friends and 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 turns their back on us because we love the Lord, I'm okay with that. I'll I'll go live on ten acres and mind my own business. I got no problem with that. Yeah. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's been great to talk to you, dude, and and uh, you, brother. and I'll, I'll I'll be in touch because I do. I'm gonna have questions, and I also feel bad about the hat because <laughs> <laughs> I did I didn't. Hey, really... man, it's all good, man. Because I know those rudest guys. I mean, I don't know Jeff Jordan and and Jim and those guys uh, personally, but one of my good friends um, has taken um, our guys up there, or not our guys now. Uh, they when I was coaching them, they were, but he's been taking our guys up there since gosh, the early 2000s, and um, and he always tells me how great those guys are and, and how and th that they're men of God and stuff. And so, hey, man, there's enough pie for everybody, man. We're just trying to eke out, out our own little piece, and and uh, we love battle gear. And, man, and that's the thing is we don't just do wrestling, man. I do – we do uh, we, we do a lot of other sports, and we've got another sport we're doing right now that's actually blowing up and – and so we really love it, and and they're and I'm telling you, man, they're they're like crazy. They're kind of like the wrestling community, um, but they're really. Uh, I find a lot of them to be really God, family, guns kind of people, you know, and uh, and they love they love our country, and so I've really enjoyed um, growing that part of our business with with that sport in particular, um, and so. You know, that's the thing is I have a roofing business that I that has allowed me to do this with Matt and build this other business because we've always loved it. And I've, I've done overseas manufacturing for um, since 2000 and um, while I was building the roofing business and stuff. And so, 
Um, yeah, brother, anytime, man. Seriously, and don't ever sweat it. But I am going to get you some battle gear and stuff. So um, probably adult large. Uh, I usually wear medium and t-shirts and stuff. Hoodies? Uh, yeah, probably medium, I would imagine. Okay, so, yeah, so you're like me. I, I still wear an adult medium, too, so, um, but I'll get you some gear, and, and, uh, man, I, I'm, like I said, man, I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm just like, how do we bring people together, and, and, uh, if Rudis is Rudis and Battle Gear is Battle Gear, I'm not trying to, man, I'm trying to, I'm, you know, it's yeah. all good. It's well, all good. Gon's pointed it out to me. He's like, it makes my eyes hurt, and I was like, I just like the hat. I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't trying to hurt anybody's feelings. Uh, that's awesome, man. Like I said, when, as soon as it came on, I was like, you got a Rudis hat on. So, but it, I mean, like I said, it's all good, man. I mean, yeah. um, I don't know how many times I've ever really went head to head with Rudis and, and, um, you know, it's all good. I mean, they make, they make good stuff and not, from what I hear and, and, um, I know my people like our stuff, so I'm all good with it. But, yeah, uh, I just, yeah we're going to keep growing. I just love wrestling. People are always like, do you have a team? And I'm like, not really. I just like wrestling, you know. I, I, oh, I, like, I like certain individuals. I, after getting saved, I don't even really like – like, I don't even watch sports. This Well, I don't really watch sports anyway now. But um, but I even when I was watching sports, I'm always watching for the guy who – that's different than every like the guy that loves the Lord. I'm 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 looking for those guys. Like, oh, he's different. Why? He loves the Lord. That's why yeah. he's different. You know. Yeah. And so I'm cheering for those guys to to do good and and have success. And and um, I'm always trying to tell the young guys like, hey man, I was an idiot. Learn from me and don't do it the way I did it. You know. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I had Seth Gross on, and he's a big uh, you know big believer and very faithful and all that stuff and. So I, I'm definitely pulling for him come the Olympic trials and. Uh, oh yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's uh, you know, that's the thing is um, I I I'd love to talk to guys like that. You know, I mean, I don't get the opportunity anymore like I used to, but I would love to. You know, especially in the wrestling world, because I would say in the last couple of years, it's really seemed over the last several years some guys that have taken some, you know, some different looks and and different walks, and it seems like a lot more faith-based guys are out there now and and um and so i'm like i'm always one of those curious people like man i'd love to talk to those guys and really just talk christianity with them talk jesus with them and and um you know see what kind of a jesus freak they really are you know and so um and and offer advice if i can you know because you know i've, I've been walking this uh for about 25 years now and and uh again far from perfect but um i know who i know who I'm not turning my back on, yeah. you know, I well, mean, it's, so, uh, you know, man, I'll be praying for you, brother. I I'm telling you, I look forward to more conversations. Just, you know, just us, um, round tabling about what the Lord's doing in your life or, or my life or, or our lives. Um, you know, I would, I would tell you my one thing I would tell you is, is read the word and, um, a book that was very impactful for me. Cause I don't, I don't read a lot of other books to be honest with you. I get people all the time. Like Rick, you ought to read this book. I'm like, I don't know the word of God well enough to read another man's book. Um, but uh, Dr. Tony Evans, okay. um, Kingdom Man, <sighs> send me your address. I'll send you one of those with some battle gear. Okay. It's, um, and I mean, it, which is what I say all the time, that the, the problem in our country is the break, breakdown of the nucleus family, man. Yeah. And Dr. Evans is big on men stepping up and, and being kingdom men. And so um, that's one book that I made um, – well, I got started on it because I, I listened to Dr. Evans a lot and um, him and Adrian Rogers, man. Adrian Rogers is my absolute go to. OK, um, but uh, Dr. Evans is is phenomenal. And I was listening to him and he wrote the book and I was like, you know what? I'm going to give this a shot because Kingdom Men, you know, and this is kind of what I'm always telling men is we have to be men, man. We have to lead our families. And if you're not if you're not the pastor of your own home then shame on you for going on Sundays and expecting some man who doesn't even really know your family that well and isn't inside your walls. Shame on you thinking that man should be able to do it all or sending your kids to public school where they're there eight, nine hours under someone else's influence. Um, man, shame on you guys for not stepping up and being kingdom men. And that's probably one of the things I'm the biggest on right now is men stepping up and being men. That's You want to know why our kids are the way they are? You want to know why – things are the way they are is because men aren't being men and leading their homes and, yeah. and uh, we're leaving these women to have to do it on their own. And that's, that's not how God set it up for. So, um, and if you don't like it, I say, take it up with him. He's the one that wrote it. <laughs> yeah. 
it you know it it's just really cool to meet you and talk to you because for the longest time you were just you were just Ricky Williams the older the, the badass older brother of Brett Williams you know and yeah. I forever um, so when I saw you on Facebook I'm like I know who that guy is but I don't know him um, right right I said the same thing I was like I know that name I I I remember that but. But I don't know that I've ever had a conversation with him. And then I started watching some of the stuff you were posting and watching. And I was like, and, and I would tell you that some of the older things and some of the newer things, I'm like, something's going on in Tim's life too. Yeah. There's a change. Yeah, my, my older brother, uh, Jimmy, is, uh, he, was, he, he has a similar story to you. He didn't wrestle at the level you did and all that. But his, his troubles happened earlier, like in high school. But – you guys are very similar dudes. Like he was super talented and, and it didn't, it didn't work out. And you know, it's, it's another story in general, but sure. Uh, listening to you, I'm like, wow, it's almost like kind of talking to my brother, you know? Wow. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm saying. There's, there's a lot of us out there, man. And that's when, when the Lord reaches down and touches you like that. I mean, like, like I said, that day he spoke to me, nobody can take that. I mean, you can't tell me, that I didn't have an interaction with God. My daughter was not supposed to make it, and I prayed, and he, um, and and she's born and healthy. My second daughter, the doctor called us and told us was not going to live, and if she did, it would be for a couple hours. And I got his word out, and I said, Lord, you said that anything I ask for, and I'm asking right now. I need you, and she's born healthy, beautiful. Just got done playing college basketball, got a degree. You know, my wife and I were on the verge, verge of divorce whenever I first got saved because I was going one way and she was she was like, I mean, she wasn't nothing like me, but she's like, why can't we go out and, and drink and have fun and party a little bit? I mean, what are we hurting? And um, and I started asking God, you got to you got to change her. I can't do it no more. Um, we were on the verge of divorce. I was talking to my pastor real, real quick. I'll tell you this. And and I said, um. Pastor Milton, I don't think we're going to make it. This was down in Chinook at Neosho County when I was coaching down there and training. I go, I don't think I'm going to make it. We're going to make it. And he goes, well, let me ask you something, Rick. He goes, are you running the race? I was like, yeah, I'm running the race. I said, I, I'm bringing kids to church on Sundays. I'm doing a, a Bible study Monday mornings, Friday mornings with college students. I'm doing a FCA study with the basketball coach um, for kids. I said, yeah, I'm running. He goes, you are. You're running. He goes, and you're doing a great job, man. I appreciate it. He goes, now, is Jody running? I said, Pastor Milton, have you heard what I've been saying? She ain't even crawling. He goes, that's right. She's not. He goes, and if you just keep running and she's crawling, how will she ever catch you? Maybe you need to go back and crawl with your wife. And man, hit me like a ton of bricks. I started praying and uh, I, stopped, I stopped trying to like bully almost about about having a relationship with God. We ended up moving back to St. Joe to take care of my grandfather after my grandmother died. And um, I started going to this Calvary Chapel and um, um, just a non-denominal laid back, started in California. Um, Chuck Smith started out there. and um, But it was just real laid back. I mean, pastor was barefoot and in a, in a, in a t-shirt and jeans and the music, they had drums and guitars. And, um, and I started going for a couple times and uh, I said to my wife one time, I said, hey, um, you know, if you guys want to go to church, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i be going Sunday. I've been praying. And she was like, yeah, I'll go. And I was like, you will? She's like, yeah. And I was like, okay. And I've been praying that she got saved, that she would get some godly women around her that would, you know, would help pull her in the right direction because all, all of our other friends weren't. And, um, and she goes to church that day. We got up. We left getting ready to pull off. I was like, I'm not saying nothing. I'm just like, it was just another day. She looks at me. She goes, that was pretty cool. And I go, Oh, okay. She went the next Sunday, the next Sunday, fast forward two months. She's getting baptized, saved. She's doing study with these other godly women there. She's homeschooling our kids. I'm just like, man, I burned up three, three, uh, <laughs> three prayers right off the bat. When I first got saved one, not to go to prison. Um, Two, that my daughter would not d be born and die or b brain damage. Three, that my second daughter would live past, past her uh, birth. And then my fourth was my wife would get saved. And I'm like, I don't really have any more room to ask for anything else. I kind of burned them all up, you know, but it's all good. So anyway, man, I'll, I'll be rambling all day if you don't cut me off. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say this real quick that uh, I, I – 
I'm convinced more all the time that God put my wife in my life because she she is the she is the only one that I could be married to. You know, without getting into all of it, uh, God knew what I didn't know yet. You know, like because I remember pulling up to her house and I was drunk at the time and. And I remember in, in the back of my head kind of thinking, what if this is the girl I ended up with? You know, because she was always there for me no matter what. She didn't, you know, and she said something told her just to keep putting up with my crap because there was something more to me than, than just what I was doing with her. You know, oh. Which was not treating her the way, I, I cringe at the way that I, you know, I wasn't mean to her or anything, but I sure didn't honor her by any means when we were first together and right. God knew that this is the woman that can put up with all your crap and all the things that you think are important now you're going to find out that they're not and she's the only one that you know it, it's it's hard for me to explain because I know it's not brother my, my my wife's phones were family's phones were tapped by the DA and she never I mean and I told her I said get away from me I'm not good for you and she's like no I'm not leaving and I was like are you crazy? And um, I, God know, like God knows what he, what we don't know. And, and you think about it. He says, um, uh, "The woman came from 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 our flesh, right? From our bone, from our bone, and flesh from our flesh." And I think when 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 God gives you that other half, right? And it's and it's it's a God, it's that gift from God then you speak like you're speaking or speak like I'm speaking about our wives because if you're like me, Tim, and I say this all the time, my wife and my kids are better than I deserve. Yeah. Every day of the week, twice on Sunday, better than I deserve. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny the things that, that, that Christians say to you that you're like, it just all like dawns on you. It's almost like God speaking through you to me right now. And the way that's what we should be doing. I mean, that's why I was saying it's important for us to conversate with other believers. Iron sharpens iron. You know, me and Aiken have used that saying all the time. I mean, that's that's why wrestling and, and, and being a godly man go hand in hand because we understand how iron sharpens iron so one man sharpens another. When Aiken and I would go into those practice rooms or, you know, you had that workout partner, you know, um, I think Aiken ended up going to the 2000 Olympics with uh, Brands, I think, as a training partner. Why? Because iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That's and I think you know Terry knew that this is a guy that I need there to help me stay where I need to be. Same thing with our faith. We need other godly men so that we can sharpen each other, hold each other accountable, have tough conversations. I mean, be honest with each other about the stuff that we did that we're not grateful for or or proud of, but yet God has still brought us out of there and cleaned us off. And and uh, you know, I say all the time, man, I'm. I wasn't perfect when God introduced himself to me, um, but he's a, um, you know, he came for the sick, not the healthy. And, and well, I was the definition of sick. And so, I mean, uh, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent cured, but I am far from the disease ridden, disgusting person that I was too. So, you know, I'm growing every day. Well, God bless you, Rick Williams. I really appreciate you, brother. You. And uh, I'll be in touch, and, and uh, yeah, we'll talk more. I look forward to it. You have a blessed day, sir. Bless you. Bye. All right, everybody. I know that was a long podcast, but uh, I, I really needed it myself, and I hope you guys got something out of that and enjoyed it. Um, we talked about wrestling, but mainly and more importantly, we talked about God, and uh, I have. I, I, I've felt closer to God lately and wanted to be more um, – Christ-like, and none of us are ever going to be perfect, but, uh, you know, we can try. So um, God bless all of you for listening, and make sure you go to makingithappen.com, M-A-C-A-N, it happen. Help out little Bo Macon and his family, as always. And uh, subscribe and like the YouTube channel and, and the videos and all that stuff. It helps me out. And uh, hope you enjoyed that. I really did myself. And that's it. God bless all of you. Take care. Bye. Do us both a favor and click on that subscribe button.